We serve an amazing God. <laughs> Hallelujah. When Minister Ruth began to pray, the first thing out of her mouth was, God has given us dreams, visions, uh, hopes, you know, and that's part of what God's going to talk to us about tonight. Hallelujah. And I just love it. And he knows I need him to confirm <laughs> what I got, you know, and I appreciate him so much for that. I, I just love my father. You know, there is a realm that God has prepared for his people. And it's a realm that I am pressing into. And it's a realm that I am calling for myself the all things are possible realm. God wants us to get in there, hallelujah, and just everything he's provided, everything you desire of that of what he's provided, he wants you to have it. And it's not just for you, but it's for the world to see that our God is real, that our God is still alive, that our God is an awesome, amazing God. Hallelujah. And then, then it will afford an opportunity to open up a door for you and for me. When they say, girl, what's going on with you? What's going What are you doing? And you could say, it's nothing but Jesus. It's the witnessing. It's for our witnessing. It's for our witnessing. He has made us witnesses. So I can see this possibility because I see it in the word of God. And I see it in Jesus Christ. And I want it. Do you want it? Amen. I'm hungry for it. Hallelujah. And I'm fully persuaded in my heart that I can have it. Amen. In Luke 137, the word of God tells us, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Come on, say that with me. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Say that again, everybody together. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. And you know, when, when uh, this scripture was penned, it was at the account of when the angel Gabriel came to announce the birth of Jesus Christ. How fitting. Hallelujah. Because he's the one that made it all possible. You know, and he was speaking to, to Mary, and he told her, and I'm going to listen, just listen to me. I'm just from the Amplified. It says, and he said, and listen, even your relative, Elizabeth, has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel left her. Hallelujah. So they didn't think Elizabeth would ever have a baby. She's in her old age. But God. But God. Amen. But God. And what God said to me was this. Some of us have given up on our dreams have given up on our visions, have let go by even our expectations because they have not manifested. And some of us are thinking, it's December already. It's over. It is not over. It is not over. Amen. Hallelujah. Just like Elizabeth in her old age was in her sixth month, and we all know that she went all the way through that pregnancy. You are somewhere in that in those months and what is in your spirit what is in your heart would you have put that expectation in you holly don't let go of your expectation you hold fast that expectation you begin to thank god for your expectation you praise god for your expectation amen Don't abort your dream because it didn't come in your first month or your second month. Do not abort your dream. You hold fast to it. Hallelujah. Because as long as you hold fast, it's yours. Amen. Because with God, all things are possible. 
You know, and naturally, her having that baby, was it was impossible. But we serve a God who takes impossibilities and turn them into possibilities. Amen. Some people looking for, been looking, searching for a job. And you say, it hasn't happened yet. Keep trusting God. Don't give up. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then now, next, I want to tell you about this man who brought his son to Jesus Christ. And his son, and this story is in uh, Mark chapter 9. Um, verse 20 is where I'm going to begin reading. But he brought his son, first of all, to the disciples to heal him because he would have these, I call it epilepsy. And he, there was a spirit there, okay? And he brought the, 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 the uh, baby to the, well, the boy to the disciples, and they could not cast him out. Amen? So in verse 20, I'm going to read part of it. Now, the baby had a, he called, they call it a dumb spirit. And when the spirit took him, no, that's the spirits do. You're walking along, you're doing fine. All of a sudden, he just take hold because he's in there. He just take control because you don't have control. Okay? And so when that spirit would take him, he would cause him to have these seizures. So in uh, 9 and 20, so they brought him unto him, unto Jesus. And when he, the spirit, saw Jesus, straight away, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground, and he wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, how long has it been since this came upon him? This is what Jesus asked his daddy. And he said, of a child. He says, and oft times it has cast him into the fire, into the waters, to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe. All things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. So the condition here to have this baby freed from that spirit was that he had to do one thing. What was that one thing? Believe. All things are possible to him that does what? Believe. And believing entails trusting it, it means you're going to trust. You're going to rely. You're going to lean on. Even when in your mind you see other things, you're going to still believe in your heart. Amen? And we're going to speak. We're going to speak what we believe in here, not what we see here or what we believe in here. Because we know that my mama said the, this was the devil's workshop, the mind. <laughs> yeah. That's why he play around. Amen? So we want to speak what's in our heart. That's where that, that's born again spirit. So we know that the boy was made whole. He was set free. When Jesus spoke to that thing, it left him. And immediately, immediately, in verse uh, 25, I think, yeah, 25, when Jesus saw the people come running, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead. And so much that many said he's dead, but he wasn't dead. Jesus stretched his hand out and lifted him up. Amen. But notice this. Even once he was free from that spirit, that spirit tried one more time. Sometimes we're at the point where we, we be free. And then it comes back one more time. And when it comes back one more time, you got to open up your mouth and say, I am freed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Now, I believe I can have that, that all thing is possible. Numbers 23, 19. Go there with me. Numbers 23 and 19. And it reads like this. Now, we're in a few minutes. Some people are turning pages. This is one of my favorite scriptures. 
And it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good and fulfill it? God is not a man. He's not going to lie. So he's not going to repent and tell you today, I'll do that for you today, tomorrow. I don't think so. He's not going to change his mind. Amen. If he has spoken it, he's going to do it. Say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, who sent that angel to Mary? God did. Amen. So God, when the angel opened his mouth to speak, he was speaking God's words. Amen. And he said, all things are possible. Now, when Jesus spoke of that boy's father, and he helped him to get that faith he needed, and he spoke of that spirit controlling that boy, that baby was free. Being telling us what? All things are what? Possible. Jesus said the same thing God said. All things are possible to him that believeth. So don't let go of your dreams, your visions of what God has decreed to you, of what's in your heart that you've decreed to him even. He will give you the desires of your heart. Hallelujah. Don't let go of what has been personally prophesied or decreed unto you. Your prophetic words. Take those words begin to put them in your mouth. It's time for a manifestation. You know, when you think about the world and what's going on in the world now, don't ever think that the devil is going to outdo God. Where sin doth abound, what does he say? Grace does abound, what? Even more so. Even more so. God's going to get glory because his body stands up and start decreeing what God said. Yeah, we're going to pray against ISIS. We're going to decree confusion in their camp. But we're going to decree life and strength and provision and prosperity and hope and success and protection and victory into our camps. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, the world see, because that, that's people are in fear. I don't, I don't know where I'm going to go in. I don't know what's going to happen when I go in this place. It's, that's what they, that's why terrorists, they spread terror. But God, our God has, has protected us from terror. Amen. Speak life. Speak life. Amen. Hallelujah. So I just want to share with you a little bit today about a man that most of you have heard of. And um, that man was George Washington Carver, Dr. Carver. And one day, as Dr. Carver was being introduced, uh, he was going to speak at a crusade for Christ meeting. The man began to introduce him by saying this. One day, someone asked the oracle of Delhi, who was the wisest man in the world. And the oracle replied, Socrates, because he knows that he knows nothing. Hmm. And I read that. <laughs> and I, I had to put the book down and meditate on that. And I've been meditating on it ever since. And you know, out of my meditation, this is what I got from that. I'm not complimenting the source or not exalting the source, but the statement impressed me. Because to know that you know nothing humbles you. <laughs> it humbles you because you realize that you have to rely on somebody else <laughs> to accomplish what's in your heart. To do anything, oh, you got to rely upon somebody else. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. So whether it be in your personal health, whether it's in your family, your family's health, in your career, in your finances, in your relationships, in any area of your life, i got to rely on somebody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And another thing that knowing that you know nothing does is it empowers you. Yeah, it empowers you beyond you. See, because you are limited. It empowers you to go beyond yourself. 
your own natural abilities, your own natural talents, what, what you have learned. It, it, it empowers you, you to, to, to literally learn. You have to learn how to lean, how to trust, and how to rely on somebody else. Hallelujah. My God. The thing is, watch who you choose to, to, to trust. <laughs> yeah. So for us believers, that someone is God. <laughs> it's Jesus. It's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Yeah. When we really lean upon him, we know we are right. See, because no, you and knowing that I know nothing brings me to a realization that I came up with this as I was, I was meditating. This is what came to me was, I can do more with him. Yeah, I can do more with him. Because he's a limitless God. He's a limitless God. Hallelujah. So, he has made us, I can people. I can do all things. Amen. <laughs> so Dr. Carver was one of my favorite black personalities. And I, when, when I was a child, since I was a child, I went to, I don't know, when they used to have bookmobiles that come through the school. Who remember bookmobiles? 60 pluses, 50 pluses. <laughs> they didn't have libraries, so they brought a bookmobile. And you go to the bookmobile and choose books. And I picked up this book by Dr. Carver, George Washington Carver. You know, and uh, when I read the book, his character and his accomplishments made a lasting impression on me because he did so much with so little. Amen. From a peanut and a sweet potato, <laughs> this man created over 300 products, penicillin being one of the most known. He created uh, a, a cure for infantile paralysis, all kinds of stuff. And that just astounded me from a peanut. You know, he healed the plants and he, he healed the soil so plants could continue to grow and thrive in them. And that just impressed me. But you know, that, that little book taught me a lot. But what it didn't teach me, it didn't teach me how he did that. And you know, I never really thought about it. I just figured the man was smart, you know? But one day I was watching a video by uh, Billy Brim, and she began to read excerpts from this little book, and they were just blowing my mind. And so she had this little book in her hand. She was holding it kind of like, like this, you know, and I couldn't see the title. I wanted to get the title so I could order the book, you know, <laughs> but I couldn't see it. So finally, I saw the last couple of words. So I wrote that down, talks with the flowers. And then... Um, she mentioned the man's name was Dr. Carver, and I got enough information to find a book on internet. So of course I ordered the book. Amen. So as I was began to, as I was listening to her, what I found out about this man was he was a man of prayer. This man was a saved, sanctified man. This man loved the Lord. Now, if I had learned that in fourth grade, it wouldn't have been a thing to me. Oh, but it meant something to me now. <laughs> and then when I, began to, when, when I began to read the book, and as I heard her talk, this little book revealed to me the secret of his success with over 300 inventions. And it, this is a secret right here. He heard the voice of God, and he obeyed the voice of God. Amen. God literally taught this man's hands to prosper. It was that, that, that amazed, and it still amazes me. It amazes me. So, I'm going to just read. I want to read this to you. I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from it. But people would go to Dr. Carver, they would ask him questions because, I mean, he was just a little black man in the South at that time. You know, they didn't, you know, it, it wasn't like it is now. So, but they would, these people would go to him because they understood this man got some wisdom. This man got something I need. So the scientists would go to him. He was one of the scientists, and he was at Tuskegee Institute. 
Well, and so they would ask him questions about how you did that, you know, how do you do all these things? And so at this particular time, they asked a question. And the question was, how do you do it? And listen to this, what he said. <laughs> he said, um, well, they asked, is it true that you taught yourself to play the piano, to put yourself through college? Because he did. This man made paint from, from, from a clay dirt. And then painted a picture, never painted before in his life, painted pictures that people would come out to see. And they say, you had a brush, now I use my fingers. Astounding. Astounding. And so they were asking him about this, and this is what he told them. He said, there is literally nothing that I ever wanted to do, said the old great head man, that I asked the blessed creator to help me to do that I have not been able to accomplish. And somebody exclaimed, marveling, and he said, oh, not at all. It's very simple if you know how to talk with the creator. Ha! Huh. It is simply seeking the Lord and finding him. You do remember what is, he said in the Proverbs, that those who seek me early shall find me. So I just follow his advice and I find him. Do you literally seek him early, they asked? Yes, he said, all my life. I have risen, risen early at four o'clock and have gone into the woods and talked with God. There he gives me my orders for the day. Wow. Alone there with the things I love most, come out the plants, I gather specimens and study the great lessons nature is so eager to teach us all. When people are still asleep, I hear God best and learn my plan. He said, I learned my plan. He was, but he really he, he said, was, I'm learning God's plan, but I'm learning that's my plan. So whatever God teach me early, that's my plan. Huh? Whatever God teaches us, it's his plan, but it becomes our plan because we're in his hands. Amen. And he said, but could you describe to us the methods you use? He said, I never grow for methods. He said, the method is revealed the moment I am inspired, that's the anointing, to create something new. I live in the woods. I gather specimens. I listen to what God has to say to me. And after my mornings talk with God, check this out. I go into my laboratory and begin to carry out his wishes for the day. Wow. Isn't that something? What a way to live. What a way to live. I want that. Yeah, I want that. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, so this man so loved plants. He, he really loved plants. And so he always wore a flower in his lapel. But Proverbs 2, 6 through 7, you can listen. Let me read that to you. It says, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He led up sound wisdom for the righteous. And he is the buckler to them that walk uprightly. How many righteous ones in here? Well, God has laid up some sound wisdom for you. There's some sound wisdom that he has for you. It's going to come out of his mouth with knowledge and understanding. But you got to get with him. You got to get with him to see what it is. Hallelujah. So what is God's plan for you and, and, and for me? Amen. There are some plans that each of us has individually, plans, goals, like dreams, things that we just desire. And you know, a lot of times I find that things that we desire are things God put in our heart already. I knew when I was, I guess, four or five, I was going to be a school teacher. I always was going to be a teacher. We play teacher all the time. I had to be a teacher all the time. I knew I was going to be a teacher. But what's in our heart is what God has planned for us. Sometimes we settle for less, and sometimes we go for the gusto. We want it all. Hallelujah. But press into what God has put in your heart. Amen. And don't let go of it. Seek God. See what God has to say. How do I accomplish this goal, God? How do I get this thing to work in? He has the wisdom for you. Amen. And this one thing God specifically told me to mention, now those are your goals. He has a goal to his plan is this. 
that Jesus said, go ye <laughs> into all the world. That's his goal for us to go into the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. See, he has a plan for our going forth. Now, sometimes we get confused right here. We think we all got to go forth the same way. We thought we all, we all got to do it just like Pastor James did it, or just like Benny Hinn did it. Well, they got their plan from God. Who are you getting your plan from? We don't have the same personalities. I have a sister could talk. She would talk to a tree if, if, if the tree wouldn't move. She would talk, she would talk to anything, you know. And the thing about think and that people respond to her because she has a personality for that. But I don't have that personality. So I have to deal with people the way that God allows me to deal with people. You see? So you got to find out what's God's plan for your going forth. Everybody's plan is not the same. When he said go into all the world and preach, we all preach. For some reason, he has put healing down in my heart. And that stands out above all else, the, the, the healing and, and just and salvation. But what stands out in your heart? What's God's plan for you? He has the wisdom with knowledge and understanding stored up for you for what he has for you to do. Amen? Glory be to God. Get his plan for you. And don't try to walk in another man's plan. Because then you either you're, you're intimidated, uh, you're fearful about it because you're not, not sure of it anyway, but when you're in your zone, when you're in your zone, you succeed. Amen. Hallelujah. I think about, about Michael. You know, Michael is quiet up to a degree, depending on who he's around. But when Michael hit, when Michael hit, hit the, the court, the coach, my God, the lion comes out of Michael. You know, he's, he's like a different person. He's in his zone, in your zone. That anointing for that zone comes out of you. Amen. So Dr. Carver loved plants, and, and he, he prompted his love for plants caused him to pray for these plants. And he would pray for their healing. And he would take these plants and in this book, the men are talking about how he would have these plants in, in his hand. How he would just look, be looking at them so lovingly, you know. So I want to read to you another excerpt. And this one is about a little flower that someone, someone had sent him from South Carolina. And the little flower was sick, okay? And so these people are visiting him, and, and they're, they're with him, you know? And, and like I said, the people just go to, just to, just to glean wisdom from this man. So they're all there, and he's there with this little plant. He did, they say he would not put that plant down. He held the plant in his hand. And so here's, here's part of the conversation here. So the flower, He's telling them, which I hold in my hand, was sent me from South Carolina. It is suffering from a peculiar disease, which is threatening all the flowers of, the, of this variety in that state. And they want to know if I can do, do something to heal it. And he looked at it as tenderly and lovingly as a doctor would look at a patient or at a small child who's sick. Isn't that something? He had a love for those plants. And the author says a dramatic picture he made as he stood there with the little flower in his hand. A man of God and a lover of flowers, gifted with science and healing touch, called upon to save the flowers of an entire state. And nor did one of us doubt for a moment that he could heal it. And they say he, he would talk to the flower and then he would talk back in there, you know. But he kept saying he would come, come back to the flower. So he came back to the flower again. He said, but the little flower in his hand held, our, held us fascinated. And we continually came back to discuss it. And what he was doing to cure it. First, he loved it. And as we looked at him, I think that we all wondered if that was half the cure. The love. 
the love. The love. Love never fails. Love never fails. And I was, as I was reading this book, you know, I, I just began to think, you know, about those that we go out to minister to. Those that we go out in hopes to cure, in hopes to, we want to see them healed, you know. And they say, first, he loved it. First, he loved it. Do we go out because we love these people? Are we going to the hospital because we love? Or are we going because that's what I've been appointed to do? That's what, that's what we do. We go to the hospital and we pray for people. And I know how to pray. I know I know how to pray. But do you love that person? Do you love them enough to hit your knees and pray and say, God, I love this sister. I love this brother. God, teach me. For what is it that this person needs? Or what do they need? Um, what do I pray specifically for this case? But this individual, because we never know what causes sickness and disease. What causes it in one person's life, it may be the same disease, but caused by a different thing. God knows. If we would just take time and just see God, God, what do I need to pray? Because God, I know I don't know nothing. I'm relying upon you. My God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do I just take for granted? I know. I, I know how to pray. Has the Spirit of has the Holy Spirit ever quickened you to go at a certain time? Say, I need, need you to go over here and pray for so and so and so. You know, and in your mind you're thinking, well, I got I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing the other. I, I can't do that right now. You know, my prayer, at the time I go, I go do that is at 1245 on Tuesday. I can't do that today. He needs you to go when he says to go. Avail yourself to God. We're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders when we do it his way. Instead of doing what we want to do. Hallelujah. See, but first he loved it. Faith. We know we got to go in faith, but our faith is activated by the love. Yeah, our faith is expressed and energized by the love. Faith worketh by love. And then what about the love? What does Romans 5 and 5 say? It says that, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We need to examine our love sometimes. And as I was reading this, you know, um, and this is just me, that this is, this is how, this is what I do. I began to read this book, and then I'm sharing with you what came to me as I read the book. And I just stopped, I lifted up my hands, I said, Father, help me. The love of God has been shared abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. But God opened up my heart to you. Any forms of love... Any counterfeits of love, anything I've conjured up as love, anything's in there that, that's me, the Margaret love, that's not your love, please deliver me from it. Yeah, because people who are sick, people in need, they need to see the love of God. Our love is not going to get the job done. It's the love of God. Amen. When God say do something, don't question, just do it. Just do it. Hallelujah. Now, just as Dr. Carver, you know, held that little rose, you know, they say he would take a rose, he, a flower, any kind of flower, and he would hold it in his hand. And he would really and truly, he would talk to the flowers. But he, he loved flowers, so he would, he really paid attention. You know, sometimes, do you, are you ever talking to somebody and they, you know, the eyes everywhere except on you. You don't have their attention. 
Those, are, those flowers had his attention. They had his heart. Amen. And so he would look at the rose. Look at its innate beauty. And he would just look at the study, sit there and study the petals. Huh? Each petal is perfectly shaped. But still, they all come together to form this beautiful hole here. You know, and, and the, that's just how the beauty of the rose draws attention to it. I love roses. You know, the beauty of the rose is, I think it's universal. You know, but visitors travel all over the world, and they'll go to a place and find, and find a botanical garden. Just plants, nothing but plants. But talking of the rose, the rose causes people to love it because it's so pretty. Valentine's Day, they're going to rack up on some, they're going to make some money off roses. They always do. Birthdays, roses. Anniversaries, roses. You can't eat a rose. And they don't really have much of a fragrance, a very, very mild fragrance, but they're so pretty. And you love to look at them. They like to set them on your desk at work. Set them on the table at the house. You know, just have them there to look at. So you desire their presence. But Dr. Carver, looking up on a rose, he looked beyond what most of us see. He looked at the rose. And when he looked at the rose, he said he could see in that rose, it's almost like he was seeing the spirit of the rose. He admired the, the design and everything, but he saw into the life of it. He saw into the what made it, what made it, what it was. He saw into the spirit of that rose, uh, of those flowers. And then it wasn't to him just a flower. It was something special. So he would begin to talk to the plants, not just rose. He would talk to the plants. And he was actually talking to the spirit of the maker of the plants. That's what he was really talking to. He was talking to God. But he could see the spirit of life in these plants. And when he would talk to it, they would talk back to him. But it was God talking to him. Amen. And the rose, the plants would tell them what's going on, <laughs> and he would do it, and he would help them. Isn't that amazing? Now, if he could do that with flowers, my God, we're dealing with real live people. Real live people. Hallelujah. There's a scripture that says that we have that we are earthen vessels. Let me see if I wrote it down. That we have this treasure, it says, in earthen vessels. And that treasure is the glory of God. Now, this scripture that I have saved here is 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, it's at the creation has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So here we are, made of dirt, earthen vessels. Hallelujah. But we have this treasure within us, this precious treasure, which is the knowledge of the glory of God. So we have this treasure within us. And 
It's for us to shine forth and to enlighten men about who our God is, to enlighten about who Jesus is by that knowledge, knowledge within us. We are presenting him as God. So we who are living daily, no, we're dying because we're dying because the knowledge of the glory is coming forth in us, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God is, is changing us daily, daily. So just like the little flower, the little rose of the flowers that he so loved, we hold within us in this earthen vessel made from dirt, the same priceless treasure, the spirit of God, the power of life that that de delicate rose possessed. It had the spirit of life in it. That's what keeps everything alive, the spirit of life. And we all represent the knowledge of the glory of God. We represent the knowledge of his, of his, of his glory. So how do, why do I say that? Because I, nor you, don't have or didn't have and will ever have the ability to make yourself. You were made by God's knowledge of his glory. You were made by the goodness of God. You were made by his love. You were made by his mercy. Amen. It was God's knowledge of his glory that made us. And the knowledge of the glory or of the goodness of God or of the power of God is what did it. It made us vessels of life, vessels of power. It transformed our lives. You see, the Bible tells us that if any man be in Christ, we are new creatures. The old has passed away. But it was by the knowledge of the glory. It was, it was by the word, by the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's transformed us. So if I can love man enough, if we can love man enough, first of all, we love God enough to obey. But if we can love man enough, to care enough to look at a man's life, someone who's broken, and we can see his brokenness. We can see his cracked places. We can see everything about the man, but we can also acknowledge the beauty of his life at the same time. Because there's something good about everybody. There's something good about everybody. No, no matter how they look, no matter how they smell, no matter nothing, there's something good about everybody. If we can look past, look past that. Acknowledge him as being God's creation. Acknowledge him as being your sister, your brother. Even though you see all the cracks in the broken places. If we can do that. What we we're doing is we we're doing what God did when he looked at us and sent his son to die for us. Amen. And we can do that for a person and then go and talk to the creator on the behalf of that person. And allow him to tell us, God, tell us how we can fix that person's broken life, what we can do. Sometimes we can't have to pray and allow him, he has to do it. But he needs us to come and stand in the gap like Dr. Carver did for those plants. Amen. If we would do that, we would be fulfilling God's purpose for us. Because it really is, like Dr. Carver said, we little men, it's not us little men that do the work. It's the blessed creator that does the work. But he needs us to do it. He does it through us. Amen. Amen. So his philosophy was that all men have the power 
to do what he did with flowers. Because somebody asked him, so why do just so few people have that power? He said, well, no, everybody has that power. And this is what he said about on that. He said, they said, why is it that so few men can have this power? And he said, they can. Any man can. And his voice rose to a sweet and almost piercing beauty. He said, they can, if they only believe. He said, then he laid his hand on the Bible right beside him. And he said this, the secret lies all in here. Right in the promises of God. Those promises are real. But so few people believe that they are real. Then he pounded his hand on the table. He said they are as real, as solid, yet infinitely more solid and substantial than this table. Which the materialist so thoroughly believes in. If you would only believe, O oh, ye of little faith. My God. The Bible, we have this book, this Bible, our roadmap for success. It really is. Amen. And the promises in there are real, they're true. We've got to come to the place where we don't allow what our eyes behold and our ears hear. And our hands can and can't touch because I am lacking. I don't have it right now, so I'm lacking. I'm hurting. We can't allow that to dictate our believing. We believe according to the word of God. Amen. So don't hold fast to your visions. Hold fast to your dreams. Don't let go of them. Pray for those who need prayer. Hallelujah. Don't judge them. You don't know what put them where they are. My, you never know what puts a person. Sometimes I, when I ride downtown now, not as much as I used to when we had the church on Nicholson, but when I would ride down, I would see these people pushing carts and dragging clothes. I know what I would think about Katrina. Because many of those people were wealthy before Katrina. They were doing good before Katrina. You know, this man was telling me about the safe in his house and how many thousands of dollars he had in his safe. But the safe got washed away. You don't know what these people been through. But it's not our place to know. It's our place to love. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Oh, God, have mercy. Have mercy upon us, Father. Lord God, teach us, Father God, to walk as yours, truly yours. We praise you, Father God, tonight. For you are our God.